Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown out there on the edge of the prairie. It's been below zero here this week. It's been bitterly, bitterly cold. And it gets really quiet when it's that cold. You don't know that. How would you know that? But it does. Just the cold just swallows up sound and you walk outside and hear the crunch, crunch, crunch of your feet and that's all you, all you hear. My wife talks to me when it's this cold and her voice just disappears and I don't <laughs> hear anything. I can see by the way she looks that she's saying something important and uh, and after all these years, you know, I, I, I'm able to make appropriate responses, and, and, and which, is, which is right. Yes, yes, of course. No, I know that. I know that. No, I, I will. Oh, yes. And after you do that, it's a good thing to disappear for a while. It's a good strategy in marriage anyway, so I had out on the lake and I walk out on the lake and go out to my, my fishing shack out there. The ice is only 11 inches thick and that's not heavy enough to drive a car out there unless you hold your breath the whole way and lift yourself up above the seat, which I don't care to do. So I walk out there, it's about, about a little more than a quarter of a mile out there to my fishing shack and there are tracks in the snow, and they look like dog tracks, but it's a hard to see from them if, if these may be our own dogs or if these are dogs that went bad and they, and they became wild and they're coming back now because they have a score to settle. So <laughs> it's a little uneasiness as you walk to the ice fishing shack and you go inside. It's eight by 10 and there are two uh, plywood bunks on one side and there are holes, of course, if you carried to fish, you don't have to, but you could drop a line in there and there's a gasoline stove. It's very nice, it's warm. You don't want to overheat it, you know, because you are on ice and <laughs> that could turn bad on you, but, you, but it's warm in there and, uh, and you sit in there for as long as you need to. It's a lovely, lovely thing. I got this ice fishing shack from my Uncle Jack because his two daughters married men who were not interested in, in fishing. I'm not either, but when people around me talk about fishing, I look interested. And so people assume that I am a fisherman. I'm not. I just go out there. I like to go out there and sit. I used to go out there and drink brandy because I was under the impression that, that in weather that cold, you would not get drunk and you would not have a hangover. So I, I drank it by the glassful and, uh, and it was not quite that way. You, you get half drunk is what happens, which means that you still say, say stupid things, but you, but you remember them afterward. And, uh, and uh, and you have, a, you have a terrible hangover, but it doesn't come until spring, and it all comes at once. And, and there are these men up in your head with chainsaws and, uh, and sledgehammers pounding away up there. So I, so I quit uh, drinking 10 years ago, which is not a hard thing to do so long as you don't drink, you see. That's the secret of stopping, you see. Drinking would make stopping difficult. <laughs> That's my wisdom, I offer it to you. It's, uh, <laughs> it's just, you do it by, by doing it. That's, that's, that's all, and you just make up your, make up your mind. I, I, I miss it a little bit. Sobriety is like having a piano on which three of the black keys don't work and you never missed them before, but now that you don't have them, you do. That's what sobriety is like. That was actually a rather brilliant thing I just said. Uh, <laughs> it's like having a piano on which three of the black keys don't work. It's really very um, intelligent. Um, I wouldn't have been able to think of something like that if I had been drunk, you see. I, I, 
If I'd been drinking whiskey or brandy out there, I wouldn't have thought of, of, of what sobriety was like because I wouldn't be sober, you know. I would be thinking things like, why did she and I break up? It was so wonderful. I am so sad. I'm so lonely. Why did this ever happen to me? But now I'm sober and I know why. <laughs> we broke up. We broke up because we were always together, which we assumed you should be if you were in love. You should always be in each other's company. And when you are always in each other's company, you get so relaxed that you will eventually say what you actually think. <laughs> Not a good idea. Not a good idea. No, you need to go away. And that's what the fishing shack is for, is to go, is to go away. I go out there, I go out there for a day, a day and a half, a couple days even. It's very, very, very nice. And, uh, and you go out there, you sleep out there. Sometimes I have these wonderful dreams out there in the, in the, in the shack, out on the ice. I sometimes dream that I am in the shack and I walk out on the ice. And so I'm not sure in my dream if I am awake or dreaming. And there's nobody to ask. <laughs> and sometimes I'm doing a show out on the ice and there is an audience there and they are very, very quiet because they're sitting up to their waists in snow. <laughs> and I walk out among them and they're listening to something and not to me. I'm not sure if I am awake or asleep. It's very mysterious, very mysterious being out there. I love it out there on the ice, very peaceful. Winter is a time which, which is comforting for a person. It simplifies life enormously. You don't need to worry about who you are or what your mission in this life is. You are, you, 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 your mission is to stay alive, that's all. <laughs> Race means nothing, gender means nothing. Male, female, white, black, brown. It's just, we're all mammals, that's who we are. We're just so much more alike than we are different. You can't even tell gender when you are properly dressed out there <laughs> in the winter. People complain about the cold, of course, it's their privilege. They complain bitterly about it because it's one of the things that you can complain about. Same as you can, you can complain about Congress and, and the president. You can, you, can, you can go at them, rag on them all you like, and people will tolerate that uh, very, very well because you're not able to talk about the things that really trouble you, and so they serve as a surrogate, don't you see? What really troubles you is that you are middle-aged and you can see the end from here. And, <laughs> Mortality is what bothers you, and, 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 and death is out there waiting somewhere. And this is the comforting thing about being out on the lake, because death is right there. <laughs> you don't need to worry about it. It's all around you. Nature is making a serious attempt to kill you, and, <laughs> and, and, and your job is to survive. And this just focuses your attention so beautifully, so beautifully. People complain about the president, Congress, and so forth. You go into the sidetrack tap, tap even, the, even the Chatterbox Cafe, and they're, they're ragging on him. The, the, the president gave this beautiful State of the Union speech, so upbeat and positive and, and so cheerful about, about the future. And we live in this beautiful country, and this beautiful country has a great future ahead of it if we all will just, you know, work together a little bit now and then. And, but, you know, he was working against the current here. He was climbing a steep hill. That's, that's not how people feel. People, people, people are, are bitter because, because they can't complain about what they really care about. They would sound self-pitying, and so they go after the president. This is why we have elections in the fall, <laughs> the most beautiful time of year, because if we held them in the winter, we would elect dictators. <laughs> That's the reason. That's the reason for that. No, people, 
People complain, you have to get to be my age when you feel, when you feel true, true gratitude. Your great-great-grandfather came over from Norway. It took him two weeks to come over on the ship. He had no money, he arrived here, didn't understand anything people were saying. Only job he could find was to go up and, and work in the, in, the, in, the, in the lumbering up in northern Minnesota and cutting trees, working six days a week from before dawn to, to late at night, six hard days of labor. And then on Sunday, he put, he put snow into a big steel kettle, iron kettle, and he, and he boiled it, built a fire under it, and he, and he boiled 100 gallons of water, and he took off all his clothes, and he got into the water, and that was the high point of his week. <laughs> 15 minutes in warm water, and then he jumped out, and he toweled himself off, and he took off his dirty clothes and put them into his bath water, and he put on his clean clothes, and he went and he had dinner, and he went back to work early the next morning. Compared to his life, our life is a vacation cruise. It is a beautiful, easy life, but we have the privilege of complaint, of course. When I was a boy in the winter, I often thought about my storm home. All of us bus kids from out in the country, we were assigned a storm home. In case of a blizzard, you would be sent off to your storm family who lived in town. My storm family was the Krugers, and I was fascinated by them because they were Catholic, and we were sanctified brethren. And if there were a blizzard, I would be sent to the Krugers, and I could imagine them taking me in and sitting me down at a table, and they would bring out candles would be the first thing. And they would bring out incense, and they would bring out little statues, and then bigger statues. And we would pray to the statues. And I shouldn't do it but I knew that I would. Because to me, Catholics were like a foreign country. We would sit and pray to statues, Pater Noster, Quies Celi, Adeste Fidelis Leti Triumphantes, Benedictus Sanctus, they would pray. And I would sit there and absorb all of it. Of course, my family would turn against me and reject me, but that wouldn't be all bad, would it? And <laughs> I would become Catholic and a door would open. This is why I love to come to cities that are named for saints because there are Catholics there. My storm people. The door opens, I walk in, there are candles and something else happens. It's a whole new life. Happy to live in St. Paul, even happier to be in San Francisco. Next week, San Diego. I'm looking forward to it. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good looking, and all the children are above average.